Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as you can probably tell from my accent, I uh, grew up in Western Northern Ireland. Um, so now I actually transitioned here from uh, Miami, Florida area in the state a few years ago and was here at the beginning of the program at Ulster University. I've been a physician associate for going on 28 years now. So um, I've kind of had a chance to do a lot of different things within the profession. Uh, I've been in rural medicine. I've been predominantly in the emergency room uh, in the States, working in level one trauma centers and the like. Uh, I've had clinical experience working in family practice and GP settings. I've done nursing home, done first assisting in surgery. And so uh, kind of bring a, a real varied background to what I have experienced as a physician associate. And uh, I'm really the module director for clinical medicine and pharmacology, and I am the clinical placement lead for the program. And welcome. Hi, my name is Helen Harty. I am uh, did my undergraduate degree in physiology. Unlike Dan and Steve, I'm not a PA. I'm um, an academic uh, physiologist by training, and I have taught and studied um, in a number of different places in the world. Um, but I currently teach physiology on this program. I also teach evidence-based medicine and research methods, and I I'm involved with helping the students with their portfolios, pastoral care, and sorting out events like this. So welcome today. Excellent, thank you very much, Helen. And also uh, how we have to mention uh, Sheena, who's our course administrator, who keeps us all right, but uh, shies away from the camera, but uh, keeps us rolling behind the scenes. So, what I wanted to talk about was a bit about what the Qualified Physician Associate looks like and what they do, where they work, and talk a little bit about salary, some questions about indemnity that, that some of you may have, and where do we fit in terms of management structure, professional body, and regulation. So and this is something that if you are a practicing PA or a student that you're going to have to introduce yourselves clearly to patients and colleagues and so that they understand the role. So from the Faculty of Physician Associate website, we describe ourselves as medically trained and generalist healthcare professionals who will work alongside doctors and provide medical care as part of that integral MDT. And the expectations that we have and this is outlined in what's called the Competency and Curriculum Framework for the Physician Assistant, which is the curriculum that was developed nationally in 2012, was that they will be expected to perform a lot of tasks at the same level as a newly qualified doctor. So we're certainly not, we're not, we're not comparing ourselves to the training of, of doctors and medical students, but there are certain clinical work uh, capabilities that there must be a similar level to. So, um, most uh, annually, the Faculty of Physician Associates will run a census of all the PAs working across the UK. And ultimately, from that, there is a huge variation in where PAs work. There's 30 to 35 specialties that PAs are working in and growing right across primary care, secondary care, tertiary care, a lot of surgical specialties and, sp and very specialised area like haematology, neonatology. So there's a very, very broad range of opportunities out there for physician associates. Again, as part of that census, what tasks are physician associates doing in their practice? So things that we're trained to do, like taking histories, perform physical examinations, educating patients, developing digital diagnoses, developing management plans, other tasks like ECG, venipunctures, cannulation, arterial blood gases uh, are all a part of core practice. Depending on the specialty that, that you will work in, you will then potentially be upskilled in that area. So if you're working in acute medicine, it may be relevant that you're trained in doing a lumbar puncture. If you're working in respiratory medicine, it may be relevant that you learn about chest strains and, and other things like that. So there's a broad range of tasks and skills physician associates can learn, uh, depending on what specialty and what area they're, they're working in. So these are all a list of things of what PAs are currently doing in the UK uh, based on their census. A bit about the training pathway for physician associates. So after qualifying in Northern Ireland, 
um, and it follows in line the recommendations of the curriculum framework, is that the graduates will do a new graduate year uh, one in medicine or surgery, and this tends to be six months rotations for one year to, to ultimately reconcile the knowledge that they have been taught um, and also and start to developing further competencies. So that first 12 months, they you tend to get a good trust induction, um, get assessment of where you're at in terms of your knowledge and skills, get a plan to develop any gaps that there are, see the more basic patients, learn the job, um, and start developing the portfolio. And over years and over uh, that, that experience of developing those close working relationships with different professionals in the, in the MDT, you then may take on more complex skills, more complex procedures, um, take on more responsibility, maybe in terms of clinics, audits, on-call, research. There's many, many things that, that can, can uh, develop as part of the role. In terms of career prospects, so in the new graduate year, and it follows in line with recommendations of the faculty position associates, the first year is usually paid at band six. There are other areas of the UK that might employ their, their new qualified PAs at band seven, but that will be a trust decision that's made. Um, after the, that first year, you'll progress on to a band seven salary, um, sharing that on screen there. And then there are in, in, across the UK of being senior PAs and being PA leads for their areas, taking on uh, additional responsibility for those higher banding. Some PAs may com uh, combine medical education or PA education with their clinical work or they might do research as part it within their unit. Something that's uh, significant for the physician associate profession is that the GMC, the General Medical Council, who regulates doctors, will be the re future regulator of physician associates and they will be the regulatory body coming in in 2021 at some point. Um, other things that's uh, relevant to talk about um, in terms of regulation, that will they will outline what um, assessments are required for physician associates um, and what competencies are required to qualify. So all that is ahead in, in, in the future for physician associates. Um, one or two topics that I haven't completely covered, I mentioned about uh, indemnity. Um, so with, when you work within the trust, you will have crown indemnity. Um, and if you work in primary care, you would need to be added on to the GP practices indemnity and that very much depends on what skills and procedures that you're undertaking and that's different in different parts of the UK. Um, in terms of exiting the course, um, there is a requirement to complete the national uh, examinations through the Faculty of Physician Associates um, to go on to what's called the Managed Volunteer Register. So any employer um, can check is that person on the Managed Volunteer Register before they um, employ them and it's a marker of safety that this person has completed all the relevant uh, assessments, they're, they're maintaining their CPD and they are safe to enter practice and continue their practice. So I'm going to hand you over now to my colleague to continue on with the rest of the presentation. Okay, thank you Dan. Well Dan's given you an overview there of some of the things that um, PAs do. Um, which was one of the questions that we were asked before um, hand to cover. Another thing we were asked to cover is what are the requirements, what are the course entries to apply for the course and they're outlined on here, you can all read, but there's a, a minimum of a 2-2 degree in a life science or health related subject within the last five years and that degree should contain significant elements of basic medical sciences. Uh, we also want to see that you've experienced of some kind of paid or voluntary work with people. You need to have people skills, communication skills to be able to do this um, profession. Um, as well, that's the standard entry, um, but there is non-standard entry if you have um, life or work um, experience that you um, um, in the health field, we can consider that at the discretion of the course team and the course director. So, next slide. So what, sorry. So what is the, oh, this is um, what is the 
um, next stage. So you find out about it, you want to apply and um, the application is open at the moment and um, the um, closing date is the 30th of June. So that is the last day of June next month. And um, so you've got a month to put in your application. It's online and um, you need to provide a personal statement in that application. So what happens after you've applied? There's a period where we will shortlist and um, look at the applications and invite you potentially to interview. And those invitations for interview will go out in July. And the interview um, itself will be in August. The offers will then go out more than likely early September, potentially the very end of August, but more likely end of September. So the interviews in August, what are they going to consist of? Well, to be honest, we are not completely sure at stage um, whether they're going to be on campus or whether we are going to have to do some or all of the procedures of the interviews online. Um, ideally, we would have you for our multi-station selection um, morning or afternoon, and that will consist of an interview and a number of little written assignments and um, a group discussion. Um, but you will know what the interview process will be ahead of the interview. Another thing that everybody asked about are what is the state with funding? At the present time, the Department of Health funds 20 places per year for home or EU students. So for the next incoming intake, we have funding for um, these for those two years. Um, the student themselves must self-fund other um, expenses, such as your cost of living, your um, equipment, the accommodation, and all of the travel expenses. You have to travel on placement um, or with your GP and um, traveling expenses are not covered, so you have to fund that yourself. The students will also, at the end of the two years, you need to do national exams. And um, the written exam is here, but the actual OSCE exam is in Liverpool, and you will need to pay um, to take that exam and travel to that exam. Where do, can you apply for other um, grant funding um, for the course? Not that I am aware of. In, the UK, in England, there are various ways you can apply for postgraduate awards. Those do not, uh, they're not applicable in Northern Ireland. The only thing that we have are the um, fees paid. So now I'll hand over to Steve to give you an idea of the course. Okay, thank you very much, Helen. Um, so you guys, we, we've answered a few of your questions. Before I get started on this, I just want to do a, a couple of quick polls. So I'm going to throw out a question here and uh, just see how you guys respond. All right, so it looks like those of you that haven't responded, keep responding. It looks like uh, a lot of you have had at least some time to think about this decision and uh, learn a little bit more about the profession. Some of you, this is a relatively new concept for you. And so it's, that's uh, kind of uh, interesting that, you know, the profession's been around here in Northern Ireland for about three years and uh, we've only been getting students out in the actual workplace for a year, a little over a year now. And so um, for that reason, uh, it's kind of a new concept and, and people are still coming to terms with it. So next question.
Okay, and I find that kind of interesting. The, the, the reason being that uh, PAs in Northern Ireland are kind of like unicorns. We know they exist, but you just don't see them all that much. And so it's kind of uh, interesting that a lot of you have had an opportunity to uh, actually meet and hopefully talk a little bit about the PA profession to um, a, an actual working PA. So when we look at that, I mean, you know, two thirds of the people that responded said uh, they haven't had a chance to work with a PA, but the fact that a third of them have is really kind of a, a good omen about what's going on with practice in PA right now in the PA profession in Northern Ireland. So next question. Uh, so, for some reason, all right. Well, for some reason, I guess I get to answer those two questions. Well, I'll ask you a couple more questions here later on. So, a little bit about the course outline. This is full-time postgraduate, and when I say full-time, I mean full-time. Uh, there is no specific break period, per se, within the first or second years. We go from January through December, so it's a full 12-month program for all intents and purposes, and that applies to both the first didactic year and the clinical year, year two. There are holidays written into the schedule periodically throughout the first and second year, so it's not like you're going continuously, but you just don't get a three-month break in the summer. It, it's year-round, and that's one of the things that some people don't really understand or realize when they're applying to the program is that you're, you're expected to go through that entire 11 to 12-month process for two years. During that time, you'll accumulate quite a few hours uh, of classroom experience. You'll also accumulate quite a few hours of clinical placement experience. We have routine assessments that you will undertake throughout year one and scheduled assessments that you will take during year two. And these assessments have several purposes. One, obviously, is to assess how well you're learning the information, but they're also used somewhat as a teaching tool. They're also used to make sure that we're covering the information that needs to be covered. And they're also designed to help to prepare you to successfully complete your national examination. So it, it really uh, is part of the entire process as you go through this program to make sure that we're doing everything that we can to prepare you to take your national written and your national OSCE exam and be successful on those so that you can go forward and begin your career as physician associate. So again, you'll be assessed fairly regularly throughout the process uh, and uh, participation in that will kind of give you a benchmark as to where you are uh, as far as developing through the course itself. Uh, we have Objective Structured Clinical Evaluations, or OSCEs, that are administered, again, periodically. Usually in year one, those are done at the end of each system. So when you go through the head and neck system, you'll go through history taking, physical exam, you'll go through the medicine, the pharmacology, the physiology, anatomy, all of that. And at the end, you'll have a practical examination as to uh, show that you are capable of performing a safe, examination or take a competent history on a patient with a head and neck condition. And the same thing applies for each system. At the end of the year, the a 14 station uh, comprehensive OSCE situation that everyone will go through. And again, you must demonstrate competency in a variety of areas and all the areas that you've been previously tested on to show that you have ongoing competency. And then there's the national assessments and Liverpool that Helen has already addressed. In year two, you will spend quite a bit of time on placements. Again, there are some holiday periods that are written into that, but for the most part, you're going to be in these placements eight hours a day, Monday through Friday, 
for the most part, placements don't occur on weekends and a lot of times uh, bank holidays and other holidays placements are excused simply because the supervising physicians and other staff members are not there to accommodate the process of the placement. And so if it's a holiday and your, place, and your supervising physician isn't working that day, then you're not working that day. In year one, there's three primary modules, PMS 711, which is a clinical competency module that I was just talking about, will be basically a, a format for instructing you on how to take patient histories, how to perform the appropriate physical exams and to demonstrate your physical examination skills. BMS 712 is the clinical medicine and pharmacology section, which encompasses anatomy and physiology. It goes through each of the different body systems in a system by system manner, pretty much from head to toe. So you'll start off with the general dermatology and then you'll start head and neck, musculoskeletal, respiratory, cardiovascular, gastrointestinal, and you go through system by system by system. The other thing that we discussed in that module are diagnostic and therapeutic modalities. So we talk about, you know, how to order specific tests and what specific test results mean. You'll go through uh, test analysis, ECG analysis, radiology analysis, all of that. So it, it's a very big module. And then evidence-based medicine is BMS 713. And again, this is really part of developing your ability to critically assess medical literature, which is part of the learning process that will be ongoing throughout the PA program, but will also continue on into your professional career. So your ability to understand and, and um, critique medical journal articles and, and apply that information into your practice is all part of evidence-based medicine. In year two, the clinical placement uh, is the big module that basically encompasses all of the placements that you're going to be going in. Uh, as part of that process, you'll also be required to complete an electronic portfolio. And that electronic portfolio is really a critical part of what you take with you when you graduate from the program and move on to practice. When you're applying for jobs, you'll be able to show your potential uh, employers all of the different aspects of what you've done, all the clinical procedures that you've performed, all the different types of patients that you've seen. And so taking good records and maintaining this e-portfolio is really, really important as far as progressing on into your profession. And you'll continue on hopefully with that e-portfolio as you continue to progress through the different levels as a physician associate. There is a follow-up to the BMS 712 module, which is the 707 module. And that is basically, again, dealing specifically with clinical medicine. And what we do is we'll have assessments at the end of certain time frames within your placements. It's usually about every 10 weeks uh, is when you'll go on holiday. And right before you go on holiday, you'll have an exam, an assessment that will basically retest a lot of the knowledge that you should have been able to retain from year one, but also that will test new information that you should be learning while you're in year two. And then at the end of everything, there is a summative examination, which is a 200 question mock national examination. It's set up to mimic exactly what you should expect to get on your national exam. So the percentages of questions will be exactly the same as those that you'll get on your national exam. There's also, again, another OSCE portion of this that you have to go through. And in order to complete year two and move forward and be eligible to take your national exams, you have to be able to pass the summative exam and OSCE assessments in BMS 710. So that's a lot. I know that's a lot. And uh, one of the things that the first year students wanted me to remind you of the fact is that that's a lot. 
and it's it's a difficult program. It's it's unlike anything that you've done before. It, it's nothing like undergraduate, and it requires quite a bit of dedication and uh, time management and perseverance and fortitude. I was telling some of them this morning. I said, you know, you have to look at this as a marathon, not a sprint. And so it's it's a number of small races that ultimately lead into one large marathon and, and getting through and across the finish line at the end is what the ultimate goal is. So our expectations are basically that when you come here, this is a professional course, this is a professional program, and you will be graduating and becoming a health provider and healthcare professional. So one of the things that we really kind of emphasize as you go through the program is professional conduct. And it is one of the things that oftentimes people forget, but it really is an important part. And this plays a role, especially when you're going out on placements and how you interact professionally with your coworkers, how you interact with your supervisors, and, and most especially how you interact with the patients. So additionally, we expect you to uh, do all of the assigned tasks, to learn all of the assigned exams, uh, to be able to begin to become better problem solvers. I oftentimes equate this program to kind of like uh, being a police detective or being like Sherlock Holmes, where you'll have bits of information and you've got to be able to put these bits of information together to come to and, and be able to visualize the big picture, so to speak. And so it's almost like putting a puzzle together sometimes where you've got the pieces and you have to kind of figure out how the pieces fit together in order to see the picture. So we'll go through all of that. We'll talk about the clinical investigations. We'll talk about how you arrive at diagnosing. We'll talk about pharmacological management. We'll talk about non-pharmacological management. We'll take a look at uh, a lot of different aspects and the expectation is that you meet or hopefully exceed a lot of those benchmarks that we sent for you to progress on through each of the body systems. There's also some uh, procedural skills that you'll need to be able to demonstrate. So you'll be given a little booklet and you'll be required to perform a minimum number of vena punctures. You'll be required to perform a minimum number of catheterizations. You'll be required to perform a minimum number of BCGs. And so some of these you'll be able to take care of during year one. Majority of them you'll be able to take care of year two. But it's, it, again, it's our expectation that when you're out on placement that you take the steps that you need to do this. We, we can't be out there on your placements with you making sure that these things are being done. So there is some self-motivation that needs to occur in order to make sure that these uh, are done in a timely manner and completed prior to graduation. The other thing that I have high expectations of is that, you know, you seek out opportunities to learn. The one thing about medicine that I've learned over 28 years is that there's always more to learn. Medicine is constantly changing. There's always new medications. There's new diagnostic tests. There's different procedures that they're doing now that they didn't do when I was first starting. And so there's always this process of learning that's taking place. And so you have to be open to the understanding that you, you'll go through this two years but that's not where the learning ends. You're not going to know everything you need to know at the end of two years. And so the expectation is, is that while you're here at school, if you have questions, if you don't understand something, that you'll ask or you'll go and look things up. There are plenty of resources available and the, the faculty is available to you to make sure that you have an adequate understanding and that as you move from system to system, that you're, you're not just memorizing information. This, this program is not a program where you can memorize and regurgitate facts. This is a program where you need to learn information and put information together and solve problems. And that's 
really the, the important part of this and what makes it so different than any other course that you've taken in all probability. There may be a few actual courses that are similar to this, but as a program, nothing like you've ever gone through. So in year one, you'll have a, a good foundation that you can take with you into year two. And you'll be able to build on this fund of knowledge that you'll get during year one and add to that based on your clinical experiences and information that you're going to get from the people that you'll be working with on your placements. And that again is part of that expectation of learning and ongoing learning. Because what you're gonna find in medicine for those of you that haven't worked in medicine before, is that different people do things different ways. And, you know, I, I'm not here to teach you Steve's way of doing things, but there, there are certain um, things that I may do a knee exam this way, and somebody else might do a knee exam slightly different. And so you, you learn, you learn from me, you learn from them, you learn from other people, and then you adapt all of that and become your own clinician. That you, you take the good away from all of the things that you learn and you incorporate all of those things into your practice. And you put that knowledge into what you're doing on your clinical placements. So on your clinical placements, you're gonna be expected to take histories on patients by yourself. You're going to be expected to perform physical examinations by yourself and then come and present that information to your supervisor and the two of you come up with a probable diagnosis and a course of action. What is your treatment plan going to be? What additional investigations do you want to order? And so you begin to assimilate all that information in year two. And then there comes the new graduate year, the year after you've been through all of the trials and tribulations that are the PA program, and you're out there and you're working. Well, as I said, the educational process is ongoing, and um, you'll go in and re receive routine uh, appraisals from your supervisors. You'll seek out people that you're working with, to try to get them to teach you things and, and help you to improve. And so it all goes through a process. The two years of the program are very, very intensive. The second year, not quite as intensive as the first. So you got a little bit more downtime than you do in the first year. But you still have to remember that it's all part of ongoing preparation to take your nationals. And until you've taken your nationals, you're not done. And even then, after you've taken your nationals and passed them, you're still not done learning. So uh, evidence as far as what's going on, we, we see uh, these have been around for a long time in other areas. It's, it's only been in the UK uh, since about 2005. So we're, you know, we're looking at about 15 years. And there, there are a lot of different programs in the UK, and we see a, a burgeoning number of PAs that are making it through these programs and, and developing into very competent healthcare providers. Over in the States, the PA profession has been ongoing since 1970s. And so it's been over 50 years that they've had PAs and PAs really work in all different aspects of medicine. And it's something that I foresee happening here in the UK as well. And so there are plenty of evidence based articles, journals, studies that show what the uh, benefit is of having physician associates in the healthcare workforce. And that's really exciting hopefully for you because as part of a new profession you're going to be the pioneers that get this profession uh, off to a running start here in northern ireland and that's it for me helen dan you want to take it from here
Um, Dan, are you? Do you want to talk about yourself before I hand over to Maria? Or? No, that's fine. I'm I'm happy for you to continue on, Helen. Okay. Okay. So, um, um, what um I want to do is introduce Maria to you, who's going to be talking to you about her graduate story. She was one of our first cohorts. So. Over to Maria now. So, Maria, don't forget to unmute your microphone. Yeah, that's it. Perfect. Go ahead. Thanks. Hi, my name is Maria. Um, I'm just to have a slide to go through a bit of my background um, and what I'm doing now as a PA. Um, so my undergrad was in uh, biomedical science uh, over in, in Liverpool John Murray University. And after I graduated there, I started working in Haematology lab in the Ulster Hospital. So I was there for a few years before I came across the PA course and I applied for it. I was part of the first cohort there. Um, finished last April, or well, last January, I suppose. Um, and then I got a job at the Southeastern Trust as a band section graduate PA. Um, that trust likes to do three, four month rotations, so I spent them in surgery, MAU and general medicine, a bit of care of the elderly in the Down Hospital. Um, so now I'm back at the Ulster Hospital. I'm meant to be a medicine, um, like MAU type medicine, but because of the current situation with COVID, um, we're just kind of helping with things like that. So I've been redeployed to the respiratory COVID ward. Um, and that's just where I am now. Thank you much, Maria. We will maybe come back to you with some questions, but Maria was one of our um, uh, first, as I say, first cohort. And now um, I'm going to move on to one of our current second years, to Kylan, who is agreed to talk to us today. So over to Kylan. Hi, guys. Um, so my name is Kylan. So as I'm in the second year, as Helen says, of the course, so I'm just going to chat briefly about my experience so far and happy to answer any questions at the end also. Um, my background is sports science. Um, I actually started a PGC prior to this course with plans to become a PE teacher um, and came to realise that wasn't a career which was for me. So I knew I wanted to go into healthcare um, and then I'd heard about this course, read about it and actually spoke to my wife who's a doctor and I thought it sounded it was perfect for me. So, of course, it's a new course starting up in Northern Ireland and um, had some reservations, mainly because it was so new and how it would progress on, but I didn't let that put me off. Um, so I started as part of the third year cohort in January 2019. And as you can imagine, um, I was really keen, ready to study and just excited to start seeing patients. So my first year being the ma mainly your data year as it's called and um, it's very very intense where you cover a huge amount of clinical medicine so as you can probably imagine I soon had a bit of a reality check and found that I started to doubt myself and you know in terms of my capability in doing the course at this time also I had a young son at the time who was born in December just before the course started which also didn't make things easy for me Um, after a while I back into the swing of things and I suppose seeing my progress as the year went on I started to believe more in myself a little, uh, a little more and finishing that first year was definitely a massive relief and a big hurdle to get over but totally worth it. So now I'm in my second year and um, I was able to get my first three placements um, out of the way um, which were fantastic and a great learning opportunity and everyone was very accommodating and um, however with the coronavirus pandemic coming in, um, uh, a lot of my placements at the moment have been postponed. But I'm actually volunteering at a GP practice at the moment, who have been fantastic and um, in accommodating me, and that allows me to keep my skills and knowledge up um, where or when I can. Um, so I guess my take-home message from all of this is just basically, you know, it is definitely, as Steve said and mentioned earlier. It's a marathon and not a sprint. It's definitely very tough and you need to really work hard at it. And that's coming from me. I wouldn't be the, the brightest kid in the block. And um, so I really have to, I've, I've had to really work hard. Um, so I guess you just really need to have that commitment there. And it really, really does impact on your social life and your family life. 
Um, so, I mean, there is fantastic support there for from all the lecturers. So if you need to ever speak to anyone, they're there um, 24 hours, you know, and they'll always get back to you and really help you through things. So if you think you can really stick at it, it is really worthwhile applying for this course if you feel it's for you. And uh, I think it'll definitely pay off into a very rewarding career. So uh, thank you. Okay, Kylan, thank you very much. And hopefully you'll stay about in case some people have questions for us. But Absolutely. I'm moving on to the next slide um, now. So having looked at um, all the people who have registered and they were asked to see if they had any questions, the questions they po you typically posed were, what was the role of the PA? Hopefully we've covered that. We've talked about the entry process and the selection process. Somebody did ask what the competition ratio was, and I didn't. Um, um, the competition ratio has changed over the last three years, but it's been somewhere in the region of three to one or two to one for the applicant. Um, so we're not sure what it will be this year. It is what it is. I've outlined the selection process and explained to you that at this stage, we don't know whether it's going to be online or face to face. Um, I've outlined the funding opportunity that we know about for this um, coming year, but we don't know um, about future years and in particular how that whether they'll cover East EU um, um, students. Um, we talked about the course structure and Steve went into quite a lot of um, course structure there, um, but um, if you have other questions on that, we're going to be happy to cover those. And then Dan in particular talked about what the career opportunities for. So he started you off on what the role is and what the career opportunities were. At the moment, all of our students have who have graduated have jobs. Um, and um, they, um, we don't know how many jobs they'll be going, will be available um, in the um, in the years to come. When you graduate in the UK, you are only um, qualified to work in the UK. So um, anyway, I'm going to move on to the next bit now, and. Um, and open it to the floor with questions and um, that any might want. Okay, I, I see your hand, Rita. I hope Anton will be with you. What, one of the things, before, before I answer your question, Rita, uh, one of the things that I do want to point out is we were very fortunate and we actually had uh, two PAs, uh, two PA positions open up in primary care. So. Two GP surgeries were given an opportunity and do a grant process to look at hiring PA. So that was really one of the uh, hurdles that we had initially getting this program off the ground was trying to get PA into primary care, and that's happening. And so I really see that as a, a move forward for the PA program and something that we do want to kind of talk about. All right, that being said, go ahead, Rita, ask your question, please. Okay, we'll get back to Rita. Faye, you have a question? Yeah, hi there. Uh, my question, so I heard you say, um, you make comments about jobs and say only the physio and um, physician associate that um, went to school in the UK um, can be allowed to work in the UK. I was just wondering, Considering Northern Ireland, so if one is trained in Northern Ireland, for example, can they walk in the Republic of Ireland? Or that's still not established. I might be able to answer part of that question. So I am UK trained, so I qualified out of the University of Aberdeen and I moved to RCSI uh, to teach, but also I work clinically in Beaumont Hospital. Um, so there is that ability to you go from the UK to work in the Republic of Ireland. Now, what I don't think there is that ability to, to do a course in the Republic of Ireland and work in the UK, simply because to work in the UK, you need to have completed the UK national examinations. And that is similar to uh, other countries like 
either the US, which Steve will be able to talk about, or the Netherlands, or other countries that have uh, national regulatory bodies. So there is ability to go from the UK to the Republic of Ireland, I guess from my own personal experience, but I don't think there's ability to work the other way at present. Okay, thank you. After Sam, do you have a question? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, hi, hi everyone, uh, and thanks for the um, uh, lovely presentation. Uh, um, you mentioned all your students have shops. Will this shop, these shops available here in Northern Ireland or elsewhere in the UK? Because uh, I'm living in Northern Ireland and I'm interested to stay in Northern Ireland and have a job in Northern Ireland. I don't like to go to, to the mainland. So is there jobs available here in Northern Ireland, all jobs available here, or the students have to go over there in the mainland? So I'm happy the, to answer that, or Dan, if you. Dan. Yeah, so I guess the it falls in line with the Department of Health funding. So their goal was to train and retain physician associates in Northern Ireland, um, and the all of our graduates are working in Northern Ireland. Now, there's no restriction on them having to stay in Northern Ireland to work, so they're free to work elsewhere in the UK. But all our guys who are currently who have passed the national examination are working in Northern Ireland. Okay. Thank you very much. And, uh, my understanding is, is as long as you pass the UK examination, you could apply for uh, a job in Scotland or Wales or Britain or here in Northern Ireland. Is that correct? You asking me, Steve? Yes. So, Steve, yes. Look, it, the United Kingdom comprises of four nations. Yeah. Um. So the national examination is a UK-wide examination. So, um, you are free to work anywhere within the UK once you have completed that national examination through the Faculty of Physician Associates. Great. Thanks, Dan. After Sam, did you have a question? After Sam has hand up first. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, regarding the selection, will that you, you give the, the uh, priority for people who qualified as a doctor? Because I'm a qualified doctor, but I didn't, I mean, uh, um, I don't have a GMC registration, but I'm working at a, as a demonstrator in Queen's University and I have a postgraduate uh, Certificate in Medical and Clinical Education and Master in Public Health. Will that boost my application if I apply for uh, for Physician Associate or a PA? Again, I'm happy to answer that. So our selection process um, is on a merit basis. Um, so, for example, there will be certain points awarded to your the strength of your application based on your person's statement, based on your degree background, um, but also the other aspects of the selection process is that face-to-face -face interview, um, the um, situation adjustment test, um, uh, a written assignment that's usually based around a common topic or a, a, a uh, a scientific paper and the, the, the other things. So this whole application process is based on merit. Whoever are, who, on the, the top 20 uh, performing applicants on the day. Thank you. Is Sasha, okay, Sasha, you? Sasha, Sasha, you're next and then Rita, please. we take our examinations and if we pass that we're um we're able to practice in the UK and if I was wanting to then go further afield to America and Australia and you said that you have to take the national exams of that country can, would my would you just have to take the national exams or do you have to go through another process or do you know how that works Okay, I'll try and field this one. I, I can't answer for like Australia and New Zealand, but I can answer for the US. Uh, one of the stipulations that the National Commission on Certification of Physician Assistants in the US and 
the American Academy of Physician Assistants in the U.S. has in their bylaws is that the person has to have graduated from a um, program, recognized program, and um, have a program that's gone through a validation process in order for the students to be able to sit the national exam in the United States. Now, right now, uh, the the programs in the UK are beginning the process of that validation. So at present time, someone who graduates from a PA program in the UK would not be eligible to sit for the uh, physician assistant boards in the US just due to the fact that uh, their program has not gone through the validation process. Now, once they go through that process, let's say, you know, you, you come to Ulster, and even though that we, we haven't completed that process now, at some point down the road, if we can demonstrate that we've had all of these um, guidelines and all of these benchmarks in place during this time, then um, that you would be able to apply for and apply and, and potentially sit for the national exam. But until the university becomes accredited, that's probably not going to happen. Okay, I can, I can add see if they are, sorry. Oh, sorry, go ahead, it's gone. No, oh, sorry, please uh, uh, continue, sorry. Sorry, I just wanted to know um, if the national exams in the US are very similar to ones in the UK. Uh, uh, yeah, they're they're very similar. I'm I'm, I'm just going to let it go at that. Okay, at least when they started off, they were, they were almost identical. <laughs> Over the years, uh, there have probably been some changes made to the UK examination, but as far as level of difficulty, I would say it's fairly comparable to the US exam. Thank you very much. Yeah. What I just wanted to add was, um, look, at present, we can only comment on what the UK guidance is through the Faculty of Physician Associates about examinations. It's very difficult for us to, to predict and say what Australia is doing, what Canada is doing, the Netherlands. So at present, the focus within the UK is with regulation, strategy regulation, which is which is going to be done run through the GMC, and that they will be our regulator, and it will be from there then that any other discussions and and um, um similarities that with other countries. But at the present, don't think that that being able to complete a course in the UK would make you eligible to do the US program because at the moment that doesn't exist. Um, so once the, the PA program is more or the profession is more established in the UK, then the UK governing body may look to link in with other regulatory bodies in other countries to see where the equivalence levels are. But at the moment there is no equivalence internationally. Rita, what's your question please? Thank you so much. Hi, Rita, do you still have a question? I moved from an EU country to the UK in the year 2018, and then I'm um, interested in applying for the PA position, like the course, and then upon application, I tried to ask for information, and I was told um, if you are not um, a UK citizen or something like that, you are not eligible. but I I think I should I am thinking I should be because if I'm able to be allowed here to stay, there should be a possibility. So I'm just trying to know if I will be eligible for the process or if that one takes me out of the competition completely. So in terms of uh, tuition eligibility for tuition fees, the that that is open to anybody who qualifies for home. So when I talk about home, that's any of the UK countries or EU status. So okay. any country that's within the European Union, for, and that applies for the academic year of uh, 2020 and 2021, which would be our January start. Beyond that, in the following years, so if anyone was looking to apply in January 2022 or 23, we can't give clear guidance because at the moment 
the government isn't telling us that clearly what will happen in the distance but from what we can see from their guidance is if you're eligible for home or european union fees and um, going into the 2021 academic year you're eligible to apply for the program all right thank you Yaron, do you have a question yes hello um, so I wanted to ask about the international recognition of the course and the training in the UK. Um, as in, can I use my degree to work elsewhere or is it based on a country to country basis? Who wants to answer that? Dan, I think we've already I, I, answered I, 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 that I, question. Yeah. You are only eligible to work in the UK. Yeah, so as, as Steve has alluded to, to practice in the United States, you need to, to qualify from an accredited US program uh, that would allow you to sit the US national examinations. So um, in a separate country, as an example, if you want to practice in the Netherlands, you have to go through the Dutch program and their Dutch assessment process. Canada has their own training uh, programs and they have their own accreditation process. So there isn't international equivalence at at, at present. Um, and it, it's only, the only ability is to work within the UK currently. And once the regulation is in place, something may happen in the future, but that's completely out with the courses a uh, gift to talk about. And um, we, we can only talk about qualifying and working in the UK at present. Okay, but I, I think kind of what I understood on that question, and, and I might be off base on this, but uh, for Norm, is that um, it, the the program here in Northern Ireland is well recognized in the UK. And so the graduates of the program here are equivocal to the graduates of any of the programs anywhere else within the UK. And so if you chose to want to work elsewhere other than Northern Ireland, you would not be, uh, or you should not be uh, discredited because you graduated from this program, because uh, we've, we've demonstrated that students graduating from here have been competitive, uh, very much so with students from other programs within the UK. And so that shouldn't preclude you from uh, seeking employment within the UK, but outside of Northern Ireland. Hopefully that answered your question. Catherine, question? Yes, thank you. All I have is Catherine. Is there a Catherine who has a question? If not, we'll move on to Lauren. Lauren Noonan, please. Sorry, is Catherine, can you hear me? Okay, hey, yes. hang on, Laura. Catherine's here. Sorry, sorry about that. Um, I think my my microphone is off. Um, nice to meet you. Um, my family are from Northern Ireland and I used to study nursing a couple of years ago in the mainland. Um, I've been working as a nurse uh, for the last couple of years. I was just wondering what the requirements are to obtain a grant because I intend to come back um, to study in Northern Ireland and hopefully stay. Um, Again, in terms I'm, of, oh, hands sorry, Helen. For it. Go ahead, Helen. Um, Catherine, anybody from the UK um, or EU is eligible to apply. The grant covers your fees. It's a grant from the Department of Health. It doesn't come to you. It covers your fees. In terms of getting a grant for living or anything, you know, or for expenses, there's none. I know of that exist in Northern Ireland. There, okay. um, you have to fund yourself or get a bank loan or um, um, or have you know have savings. There are no other grants. Some other regions in the UK have postgraduate grants, but in Northern Ireland there aren't any. And I don't think you can get a postgraduate grant from you know, the London education postgrad people and then come over here and work. But, you know, maybe um, you have um, to look in, in the UK. Okay, um, I've got one more question, if that's possible. 
Sure, fire away. Um, so in placements on practice, yes. um, who would be your supervisor? Would it be a professionally qualified PA or would it be a medical doctor? In, in, in almost every situation, it's going to be a consultant. All, okay. of the, all of the supervisors, for the most part, that we have right now as PA leads in each of the different placements is consultant level position. So you, okay. may, you may work on any particular day with an SHO or a Reg or FY2, uh, but your supervisor is going to be consultant. Thank you. Um, I've actually got another question just popped up in my head. Wait a second, you're only limited to two questions per session, so no, okay. go ahead. Okay. Okay. No, go ahead, Laura. Go ahead. Um, sorry. <laughs> Do PAs join lectures with medical students? Oh, by all means, no. Okay. So, I guess um, to elaborate a bit more on Steve's response, so at, at Ulster University, we we are based and um, within the School of Biomedical Science, based on the Coleraine campus. So, um, we Ulster University currently does not have a medical school. There is, uh, you may have seen in the news, a, a plan for a graduate entering medical school, but. Um, in terms of the lectures, you're taught by qualified PAs, you're taught by general practitioners, you're taught by consultants from different specialties, you're taught um, by physiologists and pharmacologists from within the university. And um, so you're in a classroom of uh, 20 students, so we get to know you very well um, and can support learning in that way rather than sitting in a large lecture theatre amongst two, three hundred students. Um, and one other thing maybe to add, I guess, is there's there's many programs in the UK, 30 or more. We are one of the very few programs in the UK that, that has this level of funding in terms of tuition fees. Um, I can't comment on any other courses, but um, we ha you know, if you look and do your research, you will see that our course with having full tuition fee funding is a significant advantage. However, the cost of living things is something we look that students will have to look after themselves. Thank you very much for the funding, if you would like. Thanks. Um, Thank you. for support, because I'm a current first year student, and um, as Helen said, there's no grants at the moment, but I know a few of us were able to get bank loans, which were helpful. Um, if that was an option that you wanted to look into, um, because then it just helps uh, get through the course. And I also work part time during it, which is difficult. But if, if you're good at time management, um, you're still able to do it. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Uh, yep. um, Emma Louise has uh, also typed in the chat box as well about the access to hardship funding and, and our similar levels of, of things that the university can support in some aspects on a case by case basis. Okay, Lauren Noonan, question please. Hi, uh, thank you. Um, I was just looking at several other programmes um, in the UK and in, in Dublin who are offering the master's course. Um, and from what I can tell, the only difference would be um, in terms of progressing to a master's would be an extra research module. I'm just wondering if this is possible with your course or maybe in the future, just to clarify. So at present, um, we currently do not offer in our, in our prospectus, it's not in the, uh, not currently offered. Um, in, with the establishment of our course, our focus was on making sure our students were trained to a high level to be clinical competent, to um, to impress, I guess, for want of a better phrase, and show that they were a, a credible and safe healthcare professional group. And that has been reflected with our high pass rates at national exam level and also feedback from consultant levels. It is something that we are engaging with our current, which will be about to begin. We are going to start an engaging process with current graduates and current students to see about the demand for doing the master's um, service improvement project. So we, it is not currently offered, but it's something we are looking at engaging with the students for the future. Um, so we can't formally offered at present, but we are looking at offering it at the moment. Now that we have established the course, established the placement, and know that we are exiting students 
at a high level or a good level to the national examination stage. Okay, thank you. Yeah, just as a follow up on that, I mean, we've had two courts take two cohorts take the national written exam, and 100% in both cohorts passed the written. So we're we're well on our way of, of getting to the point where uh, we want to be as far as that goes. Craig, do you have a question? Uh, hey, yeah, um, I'm currently enrolled on the Integrated Masters program for Biomed, um, in which involves a year-long internship at the University of Indiana, the med school there in the States. Um, I do have the ultimate end goal of studying PA. However, I was going to do that on returning from the from my Integrated Masters completion. But given the whole COVID-19 situation, I am due to go out around September time, but this might not go ahead. So given the whole time frame of the application has to be able to end of June, would I be able to apply for the academic year for this coming year and possibly defer it if I can, or is that kind of frowned upon? At, at present, we, we are, are not tend to offer deferrals uh, currently in the course. And and th this is, a, I suppose, a, from a personal experience that we'll share with you that um, about two years ago, we did offer deferrals to a number of people. Uh, a year down the line, none of those people we offered deferrals to um, took up that place um, and also meant that it left other people with very short notice in offering a place. So at present, we we aren't inclined to offer deferrals. We're dealing with applications uh, to start in the January 2021 uh, calendar year. Okay, would it be if I was to apply for, say, this year and given that I to get a master's aspect doesn't go ahead because of the situation? Um, that would be fine then for coming in for the January year. If it were to go ahead as I am enrolled for that program, I would, I would then have to per se, terminate my application and then apply again for the next academic it, year? It, yeah, it might be a case of just uh, re reapplying in the following year. And you know, if you're using that as an opportunity to get some insight into the application process or a practice run or keeping your options open, that, that's reasonable to do. That's great. Thank you very much. Hi, Eleanor Holland. You're the next contestant, please. Eleanor. Hello there. there. Sorry. How are you doing? Um, I'm just wondering, um, Catherine actually asked one of the questions I was going to ask, but the only other question I have is um, on placements, is there, you know, is it just your standard, you know, nights, days, weekends, the whole lot, or is it a nine to five thing or? It's uh, pretty much nine to five thing. There are, there are some opportunities when you're doing your OBGYN rotation, babies don't always come between nine and five. And so you may have opportunities to stay uh, after hours. Um, you may actually volunteer to come in, you know, in the middle of the night for birthing process, things like that. Uh, same whole tool with surgeries. Sometimes, you know, there are different uh, things for different types of procedures, so you might open yourself up to that. And uh, A&E placement, sometimes uh, you might get a 10-hour shift versus an eight-hour shift. But all of that being said, basically it's a nine-to-five job, no nights, no weekends. And the main reason for that is because all of the trusts pretty much want you there when the consultants are there, and guess what? A lot of consultants don't work nights and weekends. So <laughs> it's a nine to five party job. Lovely. That's great. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, Mary Coleman is up next, it seems. Hi. Hi. Um I'm sorry, maybe uh, you might have covered this at the beginning, and I actually missed the beginning of it. I'm a careers advisor, and just that, um, would you have to have a very strong science-based background before entering the, the degree or the postgrad? Yes, yeah, you, you would. Yeah. So in terms of um, entry requirements, it's a, at a two-two level in a life science degree background. 
Um, and part of the reason of that is the, the, the intensity of the course. And we, we look students to have some baseline knowledge in terms of the core basic medical sciences like anatomy, physiology, because the volume of information that has been given to students, there has to be some baseline knowledge going into the course because not everything can be covered from scratch. And um, so there's a lot of um, expectation that there is a baseline knowledge of uh, basic medical sciences coming from a life science degree. Okay, thanks very much. Ms. Admin, it looks like you're up again. Do you have a question, another question? Hello, yes. Go right ahead. Yeah, uh, I, I have two questions, please. I understand that the course will commence on January 2021. Uh, uh, I mean, taking the, the, the uh, bearing in mind the situation of COVID-19, will the course will be go ahead, I mean, uh, as a face-to-face -to -face uh, tuition at the university? And if not, will online teaching will be the option? And the second uh, question is uh, regarding the progress of BA. There is no progress of BA. Once you graduated as BA, you're going to stay as BA. There is no, I mean, uh, uh, progress of it. Is there any progress from BA? And the BA will do locum. Can BA do locum or situ, or they only do locum BA once they graduated? Thank you very much. With regard to the course starting, the course um, is planned to start um, the first week in January and we would in hope that it is back to being face-to-face -face teaching um, but no one knows <laughs> uh, we would hope that we would be back to face-to-face -face teaching in um, September um, or sooner if possible um, in terms of but again you know if no one no one has a crystal ball for that one um, in terms of the pa progression um, uh, and being able to work as an sho locum no you are you graduate as a pa you do not um, graduate as a, as an equivalent um, um sho or or first year at you you are not um, um, there to be able to do locums for SHOs. You work in a PA role. Um, and the career structure, there is a career structure for PAs, um, but it's developing at the moment. And Dan would maybe be able to um, elaborate more on that. Thank you very much. Yeah, OK. So um, I guess in context of COVID, um, we are currently teaching our year one students online with lectures um, and problem-based learning sessions. So the learning for our, our current first years are, are continuing. Um, year two, um, we, we may try and meet our students uh, once a week on a Friday afternoon to do clinical scenario reviews and OSCE practice. So learning is still continuing for our current students. And depending on what the university-wide guidance is at the time, we will have to follow that. Um, in terms of the progression of PAs, um, there, I have met PAs in the UK at conferences who have been working for 10 years. Um, they lead on so many aspects of certain parts of their service or audit. Some of them are doing very advanced um, procedural skills um, and taking on more responsibility. Um, so there, there isn't a I do want to compare physician associates to any particular grade of doctor from foundation year one to F2 um, to, to specialty trainees and beyond. The physician associate profession is unique in its own right. Um, it very much depends on the area that you're working in and what your consultant supervisors are happy to train you in and happy to um, supervise and then allow you to do that with it, you know, independently with remote supervision. Um, to, to elaborate a bit further on the locum perspective, um, there are, I guess, in other areas of the UK where the profession is more established, where there is locum opportunities for physician associates. At, in, in Northern Ireland, the profession is very well and developing. And ultimately, what the trusts are looking to do here is that they're spending huge amounts of money on the flexible workforce and they need to restructure that. So this is somebody who, as a qualified physician associate, you may stay in that department for your entire career, which is a benefit. 
um, to the department so they can invest in you, they can train you. And not only that can help assist with the training of others by freeing up other people's time or the redistribution of tasks within the team. So um, there isn't a direct comparison with doctors here. It's a, it's a profession in its own right, but there is extended practice to develop as you train and, and, and work. Thank you very much. Zach Nisbet, have a question for us, sir. Hi there. Uh, I was just wondering, um, in relation to like the elective placement that you offer, um, would that be involving things such as working in other parts of the UK, or um, is that purely just within Northern Ireland? Uh, excellent question, Zach. And short answer to that question is you can do your elective placement anywhere on the planet. Now, that being said, um, you know, obviously, I, I'm, I'm somewhat tongue in cheek, but no, I mean, I, I've had uh, students who have expressed an interest in doing their elective rotation in the States. And I have several PA friends who work down in Florida who would be more than happy to work in cardiology, be more than happy to um, have students come there and spend three weeks doing a uh, cardiovascular rotation and having them work through that. Or if you wanted to go and do a uh, rotation over in um, Edinburgh or Glasgow or London or anywhere for that matter, you want to go and do a rotation over in Paris. Uh, it, it requires a little bit more paperwork and stuff to formulate and get all this stuff done. And there are certain regulations and, and uh, minimum uh, stipulations that would have to be met but each of those is handled on a case-by-case -case basis. And the, the whole idea with the elective rotations is for people to you know, look, look at an avenue of medicine where they have a keen interest and then maybe spend three weeks doing that. And, and I, I'm trying to encourage uh, people to look a little bit outside the normal placement routine because that's how the PA profession is going to expand is to get PAs here in Northern Ireland or elsewhere um, out into some of these other clinical specialties and uh, see whether or not there's a, an impact or a role. I had uh, one of the students from last year's cohort do elective rotation at uh, GYN clinic in one of the trust hospitals here in Northern Ireland uh, and they're actively uh, looking at hiring a PA now to work in that department where they would never have considered it before if that PA hadn't specifically requested to do an elected placement there. So, you know, those are the opportunities that we're looking for. We're looking to expand the program and not just sit in a rut and do the same thing over and over again, but to look at other opportunities. I know Dan wants to add into that. Uh, no, Steve, I think I have nothing to add in there. I guess uh, it's it's an evolving process um, and the opportunities are out there. Great. So how exactly um, does that work then? You mentioned if people wanted to go abroad, how is that possible if then you aren't able to work there afterwards? Uh, well, so, I mean, you can go do an elective rotation wherever you want. Like I said, you could go and do an elective rotation in Miami, Florida for three weeks in cardiovascular surgery. Um, it's, it's there for experience, it's there to get the clinical hours, it's there to look at other opportunities, but you're not going to get a job working as a PA in cardiovascular surgery in Miami, Florida. So, it, it, and, and one of the things that people do use their elective placement for is a protective, uh, prospective job. So, if you, let's say, you were working in a GP surgery in Newcastle, and everything went really well during your GP placement and they want you to come and work for them after you graduate. Well, you could theoretically go and do your three week elective placement there and, um, you know, help to integrate yourself into the staff and the process and help in that transition so that when you do graduate and you're ready to go to work, you're ready to step into your role, you know, immediately. So some people look at uh, taking their elective placement as, uh, a, a pre-job uh, opportunity to kind of learn how the practice works and make sure that that's something that they really want to do. So, uh, but as far as outside the UK, now you can do placements outside the UK, but you're not going to be able to compete for jobs outside the UK in all probability. So, 
it's it's totally up to you if you want to go abroad to do something like that. Great. Um, I just have one final question as well um, in relation to that. Um, my undergraduate degree has just finished in um, sports science, so um, through that I've kind of got an interest in uh, orthopedics and kind of trauma. Um, so I was just wondering if there are kind of options within maybe surgery or something like that to do in the course as well. I think Dan can answer this, uh, and I know that um, one of the PAs that was here at the initiation of the program had worked in orthopedics, and in the United States, now I'll just speak about the U.S. because the, it's slightly different here, but in the U.S., orthopedics, orthopedic surgery is one of the biggest areas as far as PA um, hiring and PAs do first assisting um, for joint replacements. They, they do a lot of uh, some of the minor muscular tendinous types of procedures with uh, direct or indirect supervision from orthopedic surgeons. So they also are involved in a lot of the preoperative and postoperative care in, in patients. And so uh, there are opportunities, and I know there, there are opportunities within the UK for PAs to specialize and work primarily in orthopedics. Now, before Dan jumps in, one, one other thing I would say is you may want to specialize, and, and that's great, and, I, and I, I try not to discourage it too much, but you also have to remember that PAs have to take a recertification examination every six years. And if you come out of PA school and you go directly into orthopedics and you do nothing but orthopedics for six years, you're gonna struggle six years from now when it comes time to take your recertification examination. So it's not necessarily always the best avenue to come out of PA school and go directly into specialty care. Sometimes it does you a lot of good to spend a couple of years doing primary care or doing uh, hospital-like medicine so that you learn how to take histories, you learn how to do all the other things that you're gonna be expected to be able to reproduce on that exam. So on that note, I will let Dan step in. Thank you. Thanks. So uh, from my own personal experience, I qualified in Aberdeen and, and I worked in elective and trauma orthopedics for about two and a half years. And um, so within that, I um, would have been allocated to a small number of surgeons um, and would have been the first assistants in theatre, would involve the preparation and draping of the position uh, of the patient um, and would have been trained by some consultants in terms of skin closure um, and then getting the patient off the table. That would have enabled the surgeon to leave early to write the operation note and start preparing for the next case. And again, I could then assist with getting the next patient in and so on. I would have been involved in ward level care of patients uh, and occasional outpatient work. So um, the, the opportunities in any specialty are endless and, and there is medicine to deal with in, in, in even surgical specialties as well. So um, it's keep your options open and the opportunities are, are out there. Um, Great, thank you. Adding to that, and um, two of our first cohort have both got um, surgical um, jobs, so not within orthopedics, but within departments of surgery. So um, again, the, the jobs are there, or were there for yeah. PA. Yeah, as, as, as with what Helen and Dan just said, I'll, I'll kind of pile on that as well, is that really surgery is one of those places where uh, I think the PA profession was initially recognized uh, more so in the UK than a lot of the other specialties and the opportunity to use PA in the theater really something that um, that the surgeons embraced. When I when I first came over here, somebody's microphone is giving a lot of feedback. So when I first came over here I was actually working 5050 in uh, the third department at Broadway and also 50% uh, at the university. And I was in general surgery theater doing, uh, first assisting with open abdominal procedures, laparoscopic procedures. Uh, I'd go to day surgery. We did vasectomies, uh, carpal tunnel releases, trigger finger releases, and, and I, vasectomies. I was in with the surgeons doing all of those. And like Dan said, 
you know, doing closures, doing a number of different things. And so there, there's a lot of different opportunities for PAs to work in specialty arenas. Uh, and so as, as I, I reiterated what Dan said again, the opportunities are out there. Uh, you just need to be open to them when they make themselves available. All right, let's, let's move on to Maria, unless Dan or Helen have something really pressing. Hello, um, that kind of answers my question. I was going to ask about like if you have a particular interest, is the jobs there? But I was more just wondering in the previous years, I know that it is small and developing, but in the previous years, had students got jobs that they've been particularly interested in? I am happy to answer that one. So I think um, there was in the very first cohort, there was 14 jobs. We had 11 in the cohort, and there was a number of um, people from other areas of the UK who wanted to return to Northern Ireland who are working. Um, I think t um, 11 out of the 14 got their first preference choice and the rest got their second preference choice. So sometimes it does work out well because I guess from a Northern Ireland perspective, um, if I am from Coleraine, I would probably want to work in the Causeway Hospital because that's where my family is and where I work locally. Equally, if I work in Belfast, I would prefer. So it's it sort of, there is a natural geographical spread of Northern Ireland students and, and it works out that way, but I guess the inter interview and application process is on a competitive basis. Some people may really want to work in a specific specialty that, that isn't offering that opportunity at the moment in Northern Ireland, but um, some are decided that they'll choose another, or somebody in the future may decide, right, I want to go to London to work in that specialty and hope in the future then that I can come home. Or again, you have flexibility and we're generous trained, so you have that flexibility to work in other specialties. Okay, and, thank you. And sometimes that job might not be available now, but it might open itself up later on. So if you wanted to work in Daisy Hill, you might decide to take a position in Daisy Hill and so that you're positioned to be there when a particular job does open up. So, you know, that, that's another thing to take into consideration is if you want a job in a specific geographic location, then you might not get the ideal job, but that ideal job might open up six months a year down the road and if you're not already there then it might be a little bit more difficult for you to transition into that position so tara warren do you have a question for us please hello um i understand that if presently pas don't have prescribing rights and i was wondering in regards to career progression is this something currently that the faculty are working towards or is that maybe still quite far off yet I'm surprised we got this far down the question list before this one came up. Go ahead, Dan. So um, there is a couple of things that happen that needs to happen nationally. One is the statute of regulation, which is through the GMC, um, which is going to happen in 2021. What also ha is, is, is due to happen parallel to that is um, legislation needs to go up in front of parliament to change uh, an aspect of the Human Medicine Act to allow um, the PA profession to prescribe. So at the moment, it's a bit of a chicken and an egg thing where regulation must be in place first before the regulation uh, process can happen. Um, so both things are being considered by the faculty, by the GMC. They're looking at all these things at the moment. So they will, um, if you're interested in it, you can uh, uh, register for an email list to get updates from the GMC on how things are being progressed. But at the moment, we are looking for just the GMC to get statutory regulation and then following that, uh, the ability to prescribe. We don't know yet whether that will be um, a non-medical prescribing course or whether that will be built into PA programmes. We'll be guided by the GMC on that down the line. Oh, that's great. Thank you very much. I see uh, Kerry has a question. Right. So, from um, the question about, there's a question here on what is the process of getting a PA job after graduation? Does the university help with this? So, um, obviously, the, the, uh, the job interview process is independent of the course team. But what we have done in the past is we've invited um, somebody from the HR department and the trust to talk a little bit about what an application process looks like. And we, uh, within our course team, um, myself, Helen and Steve have run mock interviews on a Saturday for anyone who wants to come in to give interview practice. 
So we don't know what the questions are that the trusts will ask in their interviews, but we, we try and support everybody with um, interview practice. And also we engage with the Employment and Careers Department and we're putting resources into one of the modules to help um, give people some information and tools to, to prepare for that aspect too. So we, we try and help everybody as much as we can. Um, Cameron's got a question, I think. Cameron? Hello, can you hear me? We can, yes. Yeah, um, I have a couple of questions. Um, generally, how competitive is it to gain employment as a PA in Northern Ireland? And are there generally a lot of positions available? So to talk about the most recent um, recruitment process, there was 20 uh, or 21 trust jobs and two GP jobs, and there was 24 or 25 applicants for that. So it, with our graduating course, there was 17 students from our course, and there was a number of other uh, applicants from other courses in the UK and people qualified PAs. So, um, don't assume that that just because it's not, you've gone to Ulster University that you're guaranteed a job in Northern Ireland. You and so it, it's it's a trust application process. Um, and the, the the goal, I guess, is the department are investing a lot on in, into the course in terms of placements and tuition fees. They want to keep you in Northern Ireland. There's no contract to prevent you leaving to go to Wales or elsewhere, but um, they want to keep you there. So they try and might make sure there's adequate number of jobs at the other end um, on qualification. Okay, um, that's great. Um, can I ask another question? Certainly. Um, what should really define why someone would choose PA over, say, the graduate medicine course and the roles that they both entail? I think that's, that's something I put back to anyone who's thinking of applying. So I think my advice is to uh, research both roles carefully um, and make sure it's the right decision for you. I would never advise somebody who wants to become a doctor and uh, or be that primary surgeon or be that GP or be that consultant leading the multidisciplinary team to go and do physician associate studies. This isn't a, I suppose, a stepping stone to becoming a doctor, this is a profession in its own right. So I really just, all I can, I can talk about is just look at the course, look at the profession uh, and look at uh, graduate entry medicine if that's what your preference is and make sure it's the right thing for you um, in terms of how your work-life balance and what career and what specialty you want to go into and think about the duration of training and other things. So it's really over to anyone to think about all those things and make sure it's the right thing for them. Okay, that's perfect. Thank you. Does anybody have any more questions? Well, thank you. Thank you very much. If you do have more questions, email. Um, if there's feedback on my on my um, mic, I'm sorry. Um, what we will be doing is um, is uh, we've recorded this session. Once we have the record together, we'll upload it so that you can look back. Um, um, if you have any, if you want to look back at it, the application um, shortly or deadline is the last day of June. So um, to avoid disappointment, if you do want to apply, I would suggest you start your application before the last day in June. And um, that, um, and if you do have any questions in the meantime, please email me um, or any of the course team. Um, and if you have any feedback on today, I know a lot of you are putting up, thank you very much that it helped. So thank you very much for listening to us. Um, if you do have any feedback um, on this webinar, it's the first one we've ever done. So um, if you have any feedback, please come back to me. And um, all I can do is thank the speakers very much. Thank Anton for helping us put it together. And um, thank you for listening. Um, Bye-bye.
Thank you very much. Okay, thank, thank you, Helen, for all your work. Thank you. Yeah, great job, team. Cool. We had at one step.